record. Hello, and welcome to the Jason Cavanis Experience. I'm your host, Jason Cavanis. The Jason Cavanis Experience is brought to you by Cavanis HR. Cavanis HR will focus on your business where you've got your HR. Our guest today is Frank Carbohall. Frank, are you ready to be great today? Yes. Frank is founder president of STMPO, the Silicon Valley Latino Leadership Summit, and author of Building the Latino Future, Success Stories for the Next Generation, an inspiring collection of success stories from the country's most prominent Latinos. Building the Latino Future offers insights and advice for Latinos in any industry who wants to succeed spectacularly. The SVLL Summit brings together the best and the brightest for inspirational discussions on everything, everything from entrepreneurship to politics to executive management. STMPO is one common thread that aligns the speakers year after year. This unique event happens to cater to the Latinos, particularly young and upcomers hoping to build meaningful careers. As formerly part of the Kim Blanchard Network of keynote speakers and a former member of the Silicon Valley Coaches Federation, he also provides small business owners, CEOs, executives, and managers and directors with a framework and tools necessary to achieve their personal best. Frank also advises many diversity and inclusion teams across the Silicon Valley and beyond. He holds an MBA master's with an emphasis in human resource management, and he currently sits on the advocacy board for the Silicon Valley Education Foundation. Frank, thank you very much for being here. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much for inviting me as a guest, and I'd like to say good morning and good afternoon to folks on the East Coast, and uh, uh, a good late evening on folks uh, overseas. Thank you for having me. Yes, Frank. So why is it important from your point of view to highlight successful Latinos? You know, uh, one of the things that I like to uh, always emphasize is perception and creating a narrative that is positive for Latinos across the board. And it's very important because we really uh, are passing the baton, like, like I like to say, to uh, Generation Z and to today's millennials. And as, uh, as a profile for our community, uh, I take it seriously to be accountable and responsible for not only uh, the Latinos in our community, but for my own family members. I'm a father of three uh, young daughters and a uh, proud husband, so I always feel it's so important to continue not only the profiling, but creating that narrative, our stories. And one thing, I, like in the bio, you mentioned how Latinos are successful across a broad brand of industries, right? They said, no, not focus on one industry. Talk about that, how Latinos are successful everywhere across America and across the world in different industries. Uh, yeah, Latinos across the world and, and various industries. Uh, it's, it's a great question. You know, when I was uh, creating the, the manuscript for my book, Building the Latino Future Success Stories for the Next Generation, I really wanted to touch on stories that were of diverse industries with a complex world, being that it was uh, folks that had emphasis in nonprofit leadership, executive leadership, entrepreneurial leadership, uh, to folks that are educators of America. And for, for me, it was important to really identify Latinos and Latinas that are working in those specific industries to interview them to showcase what is the common thread, what was their struggles, what were things that they had to overcome in terms of, um, uh, you know, blocks that uh, that were in their way, and 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 it was a navigation tool for all Latinos to really have that um, that that tool set, if you will, to succeed. Can you talk some about your your Silicon Valley Latino Leadership Summit? What what's the what's the the point of that? What's the emphasis on that? And how long have you been doing it? Yeah. So the the point of the Silicon Valley Latino Leadership Summit really came to fruition in 2010. But prior to 2010, uh, my book, uh, Building the Latino Future Success Stories for the Next Generation, was launched nationally and internationally in 2009 based on the fact that uh, it was launched. There was a market crash in 2008 going into 2009. And I had to really pivot and think quickly on how to continue the momentum of making sure that my book would sell because at that time, of course, when the market crashed, Jeff Bezos also started swallowing up all the border books, all the Barnes and Noble. So I had to creatively think, how can I showcase folks that are in my book to have 
individuals that are millennials and uh, leaders in industries have access to these uh, leaders in my book, Building a Latino Future. So my thought was to meet with a mentor. His name's Dick Gonzalez. And Dick Gonzalez says, hey, Frank, you should have a leadership summit that has um, these thought leaders from your book, you know, talk about their uh, success stories. And I said, well, that's a great idea to have a summit. Where should I have it? And he's like, you know, you should uh, think of having it not only here in the Silicon Valley, but have it uh, on Sand Hill Road. Sand Hill Road is known as the venture capital mecca of the world. So the first summit was in 2010 on Sand Hill Road. And uh, are you going to have to do a virtual this year, this year, I'm guessing? Well, no, that's a great question. Actually, um, you know, I, I really like folks to have access to, to people, you know, person to person. So what I'm doing is I'm waiting for state and local officials to let me know when it is safe to have the summit. So in sp speaking of virtually, I have a show this afternoon at 3 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. S Temple with Frank, which is, uh, it's known as a, a webinar for folks that are speakers for the 2020 agenda that will be speaking every two weeks is the S Temple with Frank show. So in terms of the live summit, it will happen and I'll announce it uh, based off the fact that the Computer History Museum in Mountain View and state and local officials inform me when it's safe to have, but it will happen. Frank, can you talk some why diversity and inclusion is important for startups, even at the earlier stages? Yes, uh, diversity and inclusion at the early stages really starts uh, actually in, in uh, all sectors in terms of what I mean by sectors is we have the public and we have the private sectors. And diversity and inclusion, for example, in the public sector, you may see it a little more prevalent, but in the private sector, the, the numbers are very, um, I don't like saying discouraging because we need to be encouraged because we have the degrees, we have uh, the folks that are very talented, but we just need to make sure that the, our folks in our community are not only mentored, but sponsored into these positions in the private sector industry. When it starts with uh, industries such as, uh, for example, uh, private companies that are fortune companies, you know, the percentage is very low in terms of representation. When it's, uh, when it's in private equity and invest, investment and venture capital, the, the numbers are uh, below 2% in terms of our representation. So diversity is there, but the inclusion piece is missing. And not only being inclusive in this, uh, in this equation, if you will, but it's also being uh, at the table. And that's where the numbers lack even more. So there's two pieces to it. There's mentorship and there's sponsorship. And the latter sponsorship is what's really critical in terms of elevating the roles for diversity and inclusion. Yeah, I think that you know, everyone sees a stat where it says you have a diverse, inclusive company, your, your, your RI and your profits go way, way up, right? But it's like most people are still doing the old, old things, right? Why, how can we change that? I mean, the business case is out there, the social impact's out there, but it's like people are still like hiring their beer drinking buddies, right? Or people they know, they're not making yeah. an effort to go yeah. out and yeah. recruit. Like, like, like people say, well, I, I try, but have you really tried? If you, if you hired like your 10 people from the same, same place and you go back to the same place over and over yeah. again, I mean, what, what do you expect, right? Well, you know, and that's a great observation. And it really starts at, uh, at a, at a very young age, you know, if you think about it, in elementary school to middle school to high school, it's already starting in terms of uh, groups and networks and uh, how how folks are, uh, are 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 comfortable and not getting out of their comfort zone. So diversity starts at a very young age. It starts uh, as soon as elementary school. So we have to have teachers and educators encourage uh, mixing groups up in terms of mixing groups up is diversity really is diverse when you are challenged and the folks that need to be challenged are the adults in the room. And so as we transform into the latter part of life, when we're in colleges, that colleges are still very exclusive, not inclusive. When we talk about fraternities and sororities, that 
is when the networks and the power of networks start. The good old boy network exists profoundly. And really to be in, involved in uh, someone's network and the golf course, to not only the golf course, but to the country club of networking, those images are so profound that in order for us to be part of an image, that is the reason why I started the Silicon Valley Latino Leadership Summit and my book, Building the Latino Future, Success Stories for the Next Generation, is to show our image, es tiempo to share our stories so that the narrative from the outside looking in, you know, for, for example, the non-Latinos could see, wow, these folks, our folks are moving and shaking. And so it's inevitable that we're not only going to be invited to the table, but we're going to make noise and be the rebel rousals, rousers at the table. I think it's another challenge too. For example, we're to take two, two college kids, right? One college kid, you know, had to say both parents, you know, decent, decent background, you know, and, you know, he doesn't have to get a job right away, right? So he can afford to take a couple years off, live with his parents, maybe do a startup, you know, experiment, whatever. Another yeah. kid, you know, a single parent, parent maybe has a high school education, work in a level of jobs. So this kid graduates, he's probably kind of to get a, get a job right away and help support their family, right? So I think that's right. another disconnect, and I don't know how to, how to fix that. What are your thoughts on that? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, I love the, the, the reality behind that point because as Latinos, you know, uh, uh, most of our parents generationally coming to the United States, uh, my parents only had a third, fourth grade education. So across the board, it exists today. In 2020, we have agricultural areas here in California, whether it's Salinas or Bakersfield, Fresno, uh, down in Southern California, Imperial Valley, that still exists in terms of uh, the farm workers that are feeding our country. And, and with that being said, it's really difficult for a first generation or second generation to, to really uh, not only excel in school, but feel confident so the confidence really has to come from the outside and when i say the outside mentorship is so key so for all the latinas and latinos and latinx community listening to this podcast right now it is very critical under covid19 to continue not only to mentor but post covid19 build those relationships for these uh, young folks in college that not only instill that confidence but make sure that they're feeling comfortable to connect with you continuously because in terms of uh, Latino success it is more of a continuum when I say continuum it's never ending there's no you know there as you had mentioned for other folks outside of the Latino community there's no gray area for our community it's black and white you know we can't step in the middle and say Oh, we could pivot and wait a couple of years to go back to college. There is no way. There is no way. And I always emphasize the point that as a Latino, we're not, uh, we're not fortunate to be the Steve Jobs or the Mark Zuckerberg or, or others that have dropped out of college and create you know, this, this great idea. If we have an idea, we have to really uh, – not only hold on to that idea, of course, it's important to pitch that idea, but we must finish college. And one thing that's people, just, that's my perspective. And one thing people forget about Jeff Jobs and Jeff Bezos, like Jeff Bezos, people don't we forget that his parents gave him like $300,000 to start the company, right? Like that does happen every day. And yeah. Steve Jobs' mother was on some kind of board with the IBM person. So that's connection, right? And like, yeah, stuff like that. And uh, so I have a good friend, Ronnie Trevino, he's in the Bay Area. And here's, here's a good example. He grew up in Stockton, had no idea about startups, all that kind of stuff, joined the army, got out, and somehow got involved and became a product manager. And now he's been involved with startups for four or five years. But he was like telling me, like, he had, he had an idea that this world was like just an hour away from Stockton, right? He had no clue about it, right? He just came about by like, happenstance. And now he's like involved with startups and tech the world, you know, pretty, you know, pretty heavily, you know, but he had no idea about it growing up. He just happened, came back from the army and just yeah. found out about it by, you know, by mistake, you know? Yeah, no, no, and that's a great point. What you mentioned about R and D and ROI and product management—it really is fortunate for your friend that he had uh, the experience and later the skins in the game. But 
the the difference is you know and you said he he was um raised in stockton right i, I believe so the yeah, yeah the, the difference is is that folks that uh grow up in i say privileged families they're exposed to not only the language but the action language action is something that uh is is what really builds that confidence for a lot of these other kids and for our community you know we're not used to the language and the action in entrepreneurship as far as venture capital and other things are concerned we're used to different forms of entrepreneurship but the different forms of entrepreneurship isn't what america is really um uh, uh taking uh not only taking uh, uh, they're taking it for granted, but they're not really uh, blessing it in terms of something that is is sustainable, if you will. Yeah, you're right. It's like the Silicon VCs have all, there's all these unwritten rules, right? And there's and there's no way you can know them unless you, you know network with them and get involved in the community. That's exactly it. And you know, uh, getting into the Silicon Valley uh, network of groups is uh, it's challenging, and it takes a long time, but once once you're in it really takes um as i'd mentioned earlier the person to be responsible and accountable to share network and i think that uh that's where as latinos we need to be a little more responsible in sharing all our networks and for me as as you may know jason i am very um uh, selfless about sharing my networks and my contacts because it it's important to to share you know, contacts of, inf uh, of folks, because if we don't, then um, what's going to happen is we're going to be falling further behind. Yes. Frank, can you talk about your role? I believe you say Angeles Investing or Angels Investing. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, Angeles and, uh, Investment Group is uh, uh, a group that started in Chicago, and it's co-founded by two uh, friends of mine, uh, David Olavencia and Marcelo DeSantis. And these two folks are in the technology world in terms of uh, technology world. One is a consultant and the other works in uh, uh, various roles from consulting to executive coaching. And that's Marcelo who does executive coaching. And they invited me to be part of their advisory network group because down the road, what they would like to see in terms of uh, Angeles invest investors is have more uh, more activity in, in terms of Latino activity here in the Silicon Valley. And my role as a founder of S Tiempo is to really look at um, having a pitch competition down the road here in the Silicon Valley. And how do you all decide who to invest? And what I mean, yeah. And, and uh, one of the things that uh, is important as far as investing in groups, I mean, investing in startups is to look at uh, entrepreneurs, startups that are outliers in the sense of technology. So the, the groups that and startups that we're looking to invest in are uh, in the tech, in the tech space. And, uh, and, and with that, there is a due diligence and a process where they would submit to, uh, to Angeles directly. And with that, for example, there's a pitch competition in late May, a virtual uh, pitch competition, and the decks that that are received, we really want to look at those who are um, very innovative in the tech startup space. Okay, and there's any certain I'm guessing is there any certain demographic you want to you want to focus on for the investments, or you take take all all comers? No, that's an excellent question. We really want to focus on Latinx. Uh, his uh, Latino Hispanic groups that are entrepreneurs and that's because it was created uh, for uh, Latino entrepreneurs and motivated to inspire and fund identify and fund Latinx entrepreneurs so would one like suppose it's a two comfortable would one person have to be a Latino can you, can you have like six employees and like a low level employee be a like 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 Latin or some of the board members is like a certain like Cut and, pay, cut and paste point you have that's that's a, that's an excellent question um for example um one entrepreneur reached out to me uh, a couple of weeks ago this entrepreneur is uh from colombia from cali colombia uh professional soccer player 
and uh, he he's educated in Arizona. Uh, he has a master's degree in uh, from uh, Arizona State University, and he created this fascinating idea. But his team uh, composition is made up of uh, a diverse uh, team. It's not only Latinos, but what we're looking at is, and I asked him directly, I said, who is the founder of this idea? And he said he was. So that, uh, that process and that uh, clarification from him alone will provide us uh, the excitement to look at his deck. Mm -hmm. And so in terms of the, the entire team, uh, as long as the, the founder or co-founder is Latinx representation, then that's what we're looking at. But if the entire team, for example, outside of the uh, founder or co-founder aren't Latino or Latina, that's okay. Just as long as the, uh, the founder or co-founder are of Latinx um, representation. Okay. And can you go to more detail about your pitch event? I believe it's May 29th of this year. Yeah. So what I'm going to do is I'll provide you, uh, for your listeners, I'll provide you the link of where they could go for Angeles Investors Group for late May because that that uh, competition, pitch competition, I was asked to be an advisor after that pitch competition was formed. So as an advisor, uh, I'm going to be on the call to listen to these uh, entrepreneurs, but for your, for your listeners, I'll provide that link for late May. But in the future, my involvement as the Silicon Valley uh, looks at hosting a pitch competition, then of course, I have more skins in the game for that uh, particular event in the future. If yeah, that makes that, sense. It, it makes a lot of sense. So here's a question for you. Like suppose someone sends you a pitch deck, they apply to be in the pitch competition. Yeah. And, and you like the company and all, but they're like, there's no, like, no Hispanics on, no Latinas and that. I'm guessing you, you do for that deck to one of your connections or how would that work? Or do you say, hey, this event is for you, but let me, let me connect you with someone else? Yeah, and you know, as an advisor, I'm very, uh, as I mentioned just a few minutes ago, I'm very much about empowering uh, humanity and all, all folks. And so I would, uh, you know, respectfully let the person know, let me look at uh, my network of, uh, of folks within uh, my social platform of, uh, you know, Estiempo and uh, LinkedIn, the followers that I do have that I'm fortunate to have, or the folks that I network through my network on LinkedIn and other um, avenues, I would uh, definitely respectfully connect that person. For example, if the person had, you know, a Jewish background, I'm very well connected in the Israeli community. I would uh, connect them with a person by the name of Moshe, who is a, a mover and shaker in the Jewish community. If the person was African American, then I'm very well connected with folks in the African American community. If the folk uh, a folk that asked the question is a person of uh, Asian community, then I would make sure to connect them with an Asian community rep representative person that is in that industry. Yes. Next question. So I, I went to the, to the thing called Young Startup Venture Summit yesterday, last three days in San Francisco. So like it was a virtual event. I pitched. So a lot of people are pitching. And like half the people there, instead of pitching, they played a video, right? And did a progress demo, which of course, you know, you shouldn't do as a pitch. What yeah. mistakes are you finding people when they do when they pitch and what advice do you have them to, to do better? Yeah, don't act out of desperation and uh, don't act uh, as if you need the money today. Uh, you have to build a relationship. I always advise a person to be prepared, but also be prepared to be rejected. And when you're prepared to be rejected, it's not that you're being rejected in the sense that it's not going to ever happen. It's going to prepare you even more to, um, to go through your due diligence and, and feel that you cannot first chase you know, the, the capital. You have to have capital chase your passion. And if a person has passion with their product and they understand it really well, then they'll be prepared to pitch. But it takes time. It really is so important for me to let folks know, listening, don't get overly excited that you feel so unique that your, uh, your idea is much different 
than a person in the same industry. You have to really not only do uh, the due diligence of research, but what, what makes an outlier is really not only being so passionate about uh, your, your startup, but understanding that it's, it's different in the sense that you own it and you are the person that's going to, uh, to, to make sure that it's going to grow. So it really is about, a, about patience and uh, timing. And, and just because, you know, virtually we're hearing about all these pitch competitions, don't get overly excited. Look at if it's a fit for you and if it's a fit for you and if you have your passion uh, ready to go and you have your idea ready to go and it's not out of just desperation, then you'll be successful. Yeah, I remember reading a stat somewhere that says, you know, on average, you're going to have to do 100 pitches or going to hear her nose. A lot of people think, well, 100 no's equals 100 failures. I think you got to look at it more like that. You have 100 opportunities to refine your pitch and get better each time, right? Exactly. I mean, you know, let, let's look at uh, the Last Dance uh, documentary with Michael Jordan. You know, he would be on the basketball court practicing a, a thousand free throws. And per thousand free throws, if he made, you know, during practice 100, then that really accelerated his game, game time, because the noise and the excitement really is channeled in because of practice. And, and that is what pitch competitions are all about. And that's why I say, you know, with your passion, you have to make sure that I like to say you have to push the accelerator and then slow down. And what I mean by that is you have to take a pause and really look at the big picture and say, okay, I'm ready because I have practiced my, my craft and I understand my product. Yes, like myself, I started fundraising for my startup and I've done like eight pitches the last month. Each time I learned something new, heard a different perspective that I wouldn't have known before. Yeah, and then it, and, you know, with clarity, it's also important to identify like the, the, you know, the, the, the fact of your business, is it going to be for profit or is it going to be a nonprofit? And you really have to know the difference between the two. Commerce or is it really about fundraising? Is it fundraising in the sense that it's going to be a 501C or is it going to be a product in commerce where you really want to, you know, make money? And uh, there, there's, there's the two. And one of the things I like to say is a person that's an entrepreneur that is all about just making money, you have to really take a step back and say, you know, within that element, make sure that you also have a philanthropic uh, piece of fabric within that, that business idea. Because a person that's a venture capitalist that's sitting on the other side of the table when you're pitching, they're not going to really get excited about a person that's going in that's just uh, so excited about just making money really fast. There has to be a sense of philanthropy as well. Yes. I also read an article the other day where it said, like, you know, as an entrepreneur, you have to decide early, do you want to make a lot of money or do you want to control your company? And you can't have both, right? Can you talk about That's that right. a little bit? Yeah. Well, you know, uh, I think it's important to, to really have, before all of this, establish folks as part of your team. You know, like I like to say in basketball, there's a starting five and there's a person off the bench, right? There's a sixth man. So you really have to look at uh, the composition of your team and the composition of your team is everything because when you're pitching, uh, a person that uh, is sitting on the other side of the table really wants to know that you have a team that believes in the leader. And the leader, of course, is the person who's pitching, the CEO, and, and then – down the road, you have to really uh, show that uh, that's, it's sustainable. I mean, you don't want, when I say sustainable, you also have to have an exit strategy, right? Because the exit strategy is really what a venture capital likes to look at. What's going to be the plan in terms of acquisition? And, uh, and sustainable, is it two to five years? Or is it a company that uh, you're looking at uh, exiting in a year? And that really doesn't give much time for a team to build trust, right? So those are some things that I have to say about, uh, about sustainability and uh, acquisition and exit strategies.
Frank, can you talk about COVID-19 real fast? Like from your point of view, how's it affecting the startup community? How's it affecting fundraising now in the future? Yeah, so under COVID-19, in terms of uh, if you're an entrepreneur and you're looking to, um, for example, uh, investment, right now would be a good time to invest and uh, build confidence, right? Uh, if you're looking at startups, it's, it's important to pivot, plan, and pursue uh, the three Ps that I like to say and not give up hope. So I really think under COVID-19, we have to find strategies in terms of uh, communication is key. Communication with folks that are thinking alike, along, and have the same plan you do. So it's really important not to, not to give up hope and really understand that uh, uh, business as usual, but safety is the most important. And I mean by safety is, yes, we could still do the same type of work at home remotely, but it's important to really uh, understand that, uh, that soon, you know, we're not, gonna, we're not gonna be back to normal, but it's up to us to really not, um, you know, uh, let the communication fall through, through the gaps, if you will. I mean, because VCs, they still have to invest money, right? They still have money to invest. I mean, they still have to do due diligence and put money in the market. Correct? It's just, it can be just a cold stop, correct? That's correct. Yeah, that's correct. I mean, that's exactly it. I mean, you know, in terms of uh, investment, you really can't let the money stop. I mean, you really have to look at uh, companies that, that make sense, like make sense to you now. Uh, in terms of uh, healthcare, uh, different apps that uh, folks are forming and, and creating right now as we speak, we have uh, the due diligence to also look at uh, what's important to invest in. Yes, Frank, can you talk why HR is important to a startup? Uh, it's the most important thing right now as far as HR uh, is concerned because HR really has uh, – uh, the finger on the pulse in terms of mental health, uh, mental health and uh, other uh, aspects of, of health in general. Uh, human resources is one of the key factors for any company, whether it's small, mid-sized to large, because human resources is the gatekeeper of what makes a company thrive. So, for example, you know, uh, just a couple of days ago, as you may have read, Uber, and Airbnb had to lay off tons of employees and the person behind, uh, you know, making the call or doing a Zoom uh, layoff is the person in the human resources role. So the human resources role is also, it's critical to, um, unfortunately during this time, to apply for unemployment. But when a person's applying for unemployment, providing that person some options on where to apply uh, during COVID-19 fits that uh, will fulfill that person's um, spirit again, because human resources at the end of the day is a mental health empowerment person. Hey Frank, you might not know this off the top of your head, but what are the demographics show as far as like successful uh, startups between like, like Latino, Caucasian, you know, doing different demographic female, is there, is there anything shown like, based on, you know, your ethnicity, you're more, you're more likely to be successful or not? Yeah, that's an excellent question. And, you know, some of the, some of the reading and the studying I've done in terms of uh, entrepreneurs and startups is Latinas are uh, on the forefront of being uh, and leading uh, in terms of startups and, and becoming entrepreneurs and successful entrepreneurs. And I think a lot of it has to do with uh, the fact that as for example, as a father of three Latinas, uh, it, it's time as tiempo that women aren't overlooked because women have not only the confidence and the courage, but the patience to see that under COVID-19 things are going to be okay. Because as I always like to say, the person who was the boss in my home uh, growing up is my mom, my my mom. And the person who's the boss in my home is my wife. I mean, you know, she really is a person that, you know, calms me down during this storm. Yes. So it, it, it makes sense that, and I am so proud that Latina women are leading 
in terms of uh, entrepreneurship and startups? Frank, so someone starting a company, you know, of course they tell you, no, you know, have, you know, use a network, reach out, reach out to, you know, VCs, all, all kind of stuff. But you have, a, you have an idea, you have some traction, but you have no, you have no connect to any kind of VCs. Like, and of course, some VCs say, say, cold call me, but you know, yeah. but they get, they, they get hundreds and probably thousands of calls, emails every day. You have a, you have a, you have a company, you have traction, you, you think you have something, but, but you know, you need to fundraise, but you have no idea how to get in touch with VC. What, what do you do? Oh, that's, that's a great question. I think um, it, it's how I started back in uh, early 2000s. And that's really starting to do research on a network group that is part about uh, the part of um, networking was the group that I joined was uh, the National Society of Hispanic MBAs. And uh, it changed its name over to Prospanica. But why that helped me personally was because there was folks within that network that firsthand had uh, contact with uh, venture capitalists. And through that network, I was able to, uh, and you're right, you can't just cold call a venture capitalist. Uh, for the most part, what I know is venture capitalists, VCs, like to have a cup of uh, cafecito, and today it would be a virtual coffee. Uh, to find out a little more about you. And when you have that first meeting, I always advise not to ask for funding because VC, VCs really respect a person that is about building a relationship. And that first meeting really has to be about storytelling. And the storytelling uh, will shine when the person that's sharing, uh, sharing their personal journey and story has a lot to do with an entrepreneurial drive. And then the second meeting, uh, you know, hopefully you have that second meeting could be based on really engaging the VC in terms of engagement. It really is about, um, not wasting the venture capitalist time and talking about, you know, your, your, your business, and then the third could be emailing that VC and saying, hey, would it be okay for you to look at my deck? And uh, I'll tell you, uh, Jason, too many times, just out of the blue, I'll have uh, folks that have sent me a direct message on uh, my LinkedIn and they, they attach a deck to their message. And I've never met this person. Mm -hmm. That is a no. That, that, those things can't happen. You have to establish and build a relationship. And when I say build a relationship, we all have a sense within us and a gut feeling that is a good feeling or a bad feeling. And if it's a bad feeling, what I mean by that is that the person's not really listening, mm -hmm. then please don't waste your time. And I, I say this because We've all been through these painful experiences. As you had mentioned, 100 pitches and maybe one yes. It, it's part of life. And that's how uh, I share with my kids. That's how life works. There's going to be a lot of tears. There's going to be a lot of pain and gutful pain through the process. But when you have a good feeling of a person in the aha moment is when they lean in literally. And they say, tell me a little more. And that is a positive sign. That's what I'm telling you too. When I, when, I, when I do my pitches, I just tell people what I'm trying to do. When people say, oh, that's interesting. That's a good idea. To me, that's, I, I know that's key to work for. They don't care what I'm doing, right? They, they could care less. But if they start yeah. asking questions, then okay, now this guy's interested. He's asking detailed questions. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And I think, I think as uh, human beings and uh, uh, from a humanitarian standpoint, it's always important for a person to at least pay attention in terms of respect level to say, you know, it's a great idea, but I have someone that you should may, maybe contact. At least provide that person with some hope that you have some contact, you know, and not just say, oh yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, you're right. Interesting is a buzzword for no, thank you. Yes. And one thing I think a lot of entrepreneurs don't get or they, or they miss a point because they're so, they want to get money as fast as possible. But you bring on, bring on, you know, outside money, 
you're pretty much agreeing to a 10 year relationship that the VC firm, right? That's right. Yeah. 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 You know, um, you, you, you hit it on the head when you said, yeah, that Silicon Valley and the world of the Silicon Valley is, is an interesting place because it doesn't, um, it doesn't happen where, you know, a person with a great idea is going to get funded automatically, uh, especially under COVID-19 we're in recovery planning mode and, uh, VCs do have, uh, uh, you know, that wealth and the, the wealth to invest in individuals, but it's still going to take some time. So that's all, that's what I mean about, uh, you know, building the relationship, being patient and understanding that everything takes time. Yes. Frank, can you give us your social media links so people can reach out to you? Yes. Um, so folks could, uh, email me if they have any questions at Frank at, S Tiempo is my business, E S T I E M P O dot com. And if they'd like to know more about the Silicon Valley Latino Leadership Summit, please go to S V L L S dot com. And um, on LinkedIn, my name's Frank, last name spelled C A R B A J A L. And you could also follow uh, my S Tiempo with Frank twice a month and it's on today at three o'clock pacific standard time and we're going to focus on stem in america for latinos under COVID 19 and so listen if we have the link to the social media on the show notes you can find the show notes at www.cabinetsatetravelaw.com and be sure to share this episode with your friends so frank we'll come to the end of our talk can you give us any advice or wisdom or anything you want to talk about yeah so just don't don't fear the worst because if you fear the worst, then you're going to be discouraged to be the best. So always be empowered through not only your passion, but always be strategic in terms of pitching your idea. Those Frank, are the words I have. Frank, thank you for your time today. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Jason. It was, it was a pleasure, and I am very honored to be on your show today on Friday, May 8th. Thank you. And to our listeners, thank you for your time as well.